I wondered how powerful a magician had to be to stop time, to freeze even a goddess. Someday, Iskandar was going to teach me that trick, dead or no. Yeah, I said. I reckon there was a bar. Gone now. The baboon statues began to rumble and grind as their arms lowered. The bronze sun disk in the middle of the river sank below the surface, clearing the way into the lake. The boat shot forward straight into the flames and the boiling red waves. Through the shimmering heat, I could just make out an island in the middle of the lake. On it rose a glittering black temple that looked not at all friendly. The Hall of Judgment, I guessed. Bast nodded. Times like this, I'm glad I don't have a mortal soul. As we docked at the island, Bloodstained Blade came down to say goodbye. I hope to see you again, Lord and Lady Cain, he hummed. Your rooms will be waiting aboard the Egyptian Queen, unless, of course, you see fit to release me from service. Behind his back, Bass shook her head adamantly. Um, we'll keep you around, I told the captain. Thanks for everything. As you wish, the captain said. If Axis could frown, I'm sure he would have. Stay sharp, Carter told him. And with Bast and Khufu, we walked down the gangplank. Instead of pulling away, the ship simply, sa simply sank into the roiling lava and disappeared. I scowled at Carter. Stay sharp. I thought it was funny. You're hopeless. We walked up the steps of the Black Temple. A forest of stone pillars held up the ceiling. Every surface was carved with hieroglyphs and images, but there was no colour, just black on black. A haze from the lake drifted through the temple, and despite reed torches that burned on each pillar, it was impossible to see very far through the gloom. Stay alert, Bast warned, sniffing the air. He's close. Who? I asked. The dog, Bast said with disdain. There was a snarling noise, and a huge black shape leaped out of the mist. It tackled Bast, who rolled over and wailed in feline outrage, then raced off, leaving us alone with the beast. I suppose she had warned us that she wasn't brave. The new animal was sleek and black, like the set animal we'd seen in Washington, D.C., but more obviously canine, graceful, and rather cute, actually. A jackal, I realised, with a golden collar around its neck. Then it morphed into a young man and my heart almost stopped. He was the boy from my dreams, quite literally. The guy in black I'd seen twice before in my bar visions. In person, if possible. Anubis was even more drop-dead gorgeous. Oh, ha-ha, I didn't catch the pun, but thank you, Carter. God of the dead, drop-dead gorgeous. Yes, hilarious. Now, may I continue? He had a pale complexion. Tousled black hair and rich brown eyes like melted chocolate. He was dressed in black jeans, combat boots, like mine, a ripped t-shirt and a black leather jacket that suited him quite nicely. He was long and lean like a jackal. His ears, like a jackal's, stuck out a bit, which I found cute. And he wore a gold chain round his neck. Now, please understand, I am not boy crazy. I'm not. I spent most of the school term making fun of Liz and Emma who were, and I was very glad they weren't with me just then, because they would have teased me no end. The boy in black stood and brushed off his jacket. I'm not a dog, he grumbled. No, I agreed. You're... No doubt I would have said delicious or something equally embarrassing, but Carter saved me. You're Anubis, he asked. We've come for the feather of truth. Anubis frowned. He locked his very nice eyes with mine. You're not dead. No, I said, though we're trying awfully hard. I don't deal with the living, he said firmly. Then he looked at Khufu and Carter. However, you travel with a baboon. That shows good taste. I won't kill you until you've had a chance to explain. Why did Bast bring you here? Actually, Carter said, Thoth sent us. Carter started to tell him the story, but Khufu broke in impatiently. Ugh! Oh. Baboon speak must have been quite efficient, because Anubis nodded as if he'd just got the whole tale. I see. 
is Gauda Carter. So you're Horus and you're... His finger drifted towards me. I'm... I'm... Um... I stammered. Quite unlike me to be tongue-tied, I'll admit, but looking at Anubis, I felt as if I'd just got a large shot of Novocaine from the dentist. Carter looked at me as if I'd gone daft. I'm not Isis, I managed. I mean, Isis is milling about inside, but I'm not her. She's just visiting. Anubis tilted his head. And the two of you intend to challenge Set. That's the general idea, Carter agreed. Will you help? Anubis glowered. I remembered Thoth saying, Anubis was only in a good mood once in an eon or so. I had the feeling this is not one of those days. No, he said flatly. I'll show you why. He turned into a jackal and sped back the way he'd come. Carter and I exchanged looks. Not knowing what else to do, we ran after Anubis deeper into the gloom. In the centre of the temple was a large circular chamber that seemed to be two places at once. On the one hand, it was a great hall with blazing braziers and an empty throne at the far end. The centre of the room was dominated by a set of scales, a black iron tea with ropes linked to two golden dishes, each big enough to hold a person, but the scales were broken. One of the golden dishes was bent into a V, as if something very heavy had jumped up and down on it. The other dish was hanging by a single rope. Curled at the base of the scales, fast asleep, was the oddest monster I'd seen yet. It had the head of a crocodile with a lion's mane. The front half of its body was lion, but the back end was sleek, brown and fat. A hippo, I decided. The odd bit was the animal was tiny, I mean no larger than an average poodle, which I suppose made him a hippodoodle. So that was the hall, at least one layer of it, but at the same time I seemed to be standing in a ghostly graveyard, like a three-dimensional projection superimposed on the room. In some places the marble floor gave way to patches of mud and moss covered paving stones, lines above Lines of above-ground tombs, like miniature terraced houses, radiated from the centre of the chamber in wheel-spoke patterns. Many of the tombs had cracked open. Some were bricked up, others ringed with iron fences. Around the edges of the chamber, the black pillars shifted from sometimes changing into ancient cypress trees. I felt as if I was stepping between two different worlds, and I couldn't tell which one was real. Khufu loped straight over to the broken scales and climbed to the top, making himself right at home. He paid no attention to the hippodoodle. The jackal trotted to the steps of the throne and changed back into Anubis. Welcome, he said, to the last room you will ever see. Carter looked around in awe. The Hall of Judgment. He focused on the hippodoodle and frowned. Is that? Amit the Devourer, Anubis said. Look upon him and tremble. Amit apparently heard his name in his sleep. He made a yipping sound and turned on his back. His lion and hippo legs twitched. I wondered if netherworld monsters dreamed of chasing rabbits. I always pictured him bigger, Carter admitted. Anubis gave Carter a harsh look. Amit only has to be big enough to eat the hearts of the wicked. Trust me, he does his job well. Or he did it well anyway. Upon the scales, Khufu grunted. He almost lost his balance on the central beam and the dented saucer clanged against the floor. Why are the scales broken? I asked. Anubis frowned. Mart is weakening. I've tried to fix them, but he spread his hands helplessly. I pointed to the ghostly rows of tombs. Is that why the uh, graveyard is butting in? Carter looked at me strangely. What graveyard? The tombs, I said. The trees. What are you talking about? He can't see them, Anubis said. But you, Sadie, you're perceptive. What do you hear? At first, I didn't know what he meant. All I heard was the blood rushing through my ears and the distant rumble and crackle of the lake of fire and Khufu scratching himself and grunting. But that was nothing new. Then I closed my eyes and I heard another distant sound, music that triggered my earliest memories, my father smiling as he danced me around our house in Los Angeles. Jazz, 
I said. I opened my eyes and the hall of judgment was gone. Or not gone, but faded. I could still see the broken scales and the empty throne, but no black columns, no roar of fire. Even Carter, Khufu and Amit had disappeared. The cemetery was very real. Cracked paving stones wobbled under my feet. The humid night air smelled of spices and fish stew and old mildewed places. I might have been back in England, a churchyard in some corner of London perhaps. But the writing on the graves was in French and the air was much too mild for an English winter. The trees hung low and lush, covered with Spanish moss. And there was music. Just outside the cemetery's fence, a jazz band paraded down the street in sombre black suits and brightly coloured party hats. Saxophonists bobbed up and down, cornets and clarinets wailed, drummers grinned and swayed, their sticks flashing. And behind them, carrying flowers and torches, a crowd of revellers in funeral clothes danced round an old-fashioned black hearse as it drove along. Where are we? I said, marvelling. Anubis jumped from the top of a tomb and landed next to me. He breathed in the graveyard air, and his features relaxed. I found myself studying his mouth, the curve of his lower lip. New Orleans, he said. Sorry? The drowned city, he said in the French Quarter on the west side of the river, the shore of the dead. I love it here. That's why the Hall of Judgment often connects to this part of the mortal world. The jazz procession made its way down the street, drawing more onlookers into the party. What are they celebrating? A funeral, Anuba said. They've just put the deceased in his tomb. Now they're cutting the body loose. The mourners celebrate the dead one's life with, lot, with song and dance as they escort the empty hearse away from the cemetery. Very Egyptian, this ritual. How do you know so much? I'm the god of funerals. I know every death custom in the world. How to die properly, how to prepare the body and soul for the afterlife. I live for death. You must be fun at parties, I said. Why have you brought me here? To talk. He spread his hands. And the nearest tomb rumbled. A long white ribbon shot out of a crack in the wall. The ribbon just kept coming, weaving itself into some kind of shape next to Anubis. And my first thought was, my God, he's got a magic roll of toilet paper. Then I realised it was cloth, a length of white linen, wrappings, mummy wrappings. The cloth twisted itself into the form of a bench and Anubis sat down. I don't like Horus, he gestured for me to join him. He's loud and arrogant and thinks he's better than me, but Isis always treated me like a son. I crossed my arms. You're not my son, and I told you I'm not Isis. Anubis tilted his head. No, you don't act like a godling. You remind me of your mother. That hit me like a bucket of cold water, and sadly I knew exactly what that felt like, thanks to Zia. You've met my mother? Anubis blinked as if realising he'd done something wrong. I... I know all the dead, but each spirit's path is secret. I should not have spoken. You can't just say something like that and then clam up. Is she in the Egyptian afterlife? Did she pass your little hall of judgement? Anubis glanced uneasily at the golden scales which shimmered like a mirage in the graveyard. It is not my hall. I merely oversee it until Lord Osiris returns. I'm sorry I upset you, but I can't say anything more. I don't know why I said anything at all. It's just... Your soul has a similar glow. A strong glow. How flattering, I grumbled. My soul glows? I'm sorry, he said again. Please sit. I had no interest in letting the matter drop or sitting with him bunch of mummy wrappings, but my direct approach to information gathering didn't seem to be working. I plopped down on the bench and tried to look as annoyed as possible. So, I gave him a sulky glare. What's that for then? Are you a godling? 